Okay. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. There's another question. Uh, I, I have a question. Do you want to wait or let him the time go ahead? For me? Why don't we, we let Todd go and then? Okay. Yeah. Well, I guess we'll have time for discussion afterward. Yeah. Sorry about the glitch there. Um, hopefully it was a go. So, I'm Todd Deans, and um, a couple years ago I spoke here about uh, this idea that I'm working on and promoting called Control by Users, which is mostly about software. So Chris talked about the wires. I'm going to talk about the software that sends data over those wires, um, and particularly the web and more broadly things like apps that you run on your iPhone, your iPad, Android, and so on. Um, we've been thinking about this for quite a while now, and I want to kind of give some historical perspective and talk about some lessons, some bright spots, and some challenges um, that we're facing and try to find out what you all think about the prospects for building the kind of system that um, our speakers this morning from Turkey talked about that would really support labor, grassroots activism, and user control. So we'll talk about that. All right, so um, going back, this is kind of a historical oops, slide. Um, in software, we talk about switching. Yeah. I don't know what I can do to I'm gonna hold that and see if it, I can make it stay. Um, so, historically we talk about two broad paradigms for the way that software is provided to users. So, um, those two guys on the left are Steve Jobs and Bill Gates in their young days. Um, they really represent, in this history, the development of proprietary software, which is characterized by the use of, co of copyright in a proprietary way to um, restrict protect um, and prevent people from um, modifying software, from knowing exactly what the code is that's, that um, controls it, um, and also through patents to prevent people from um, using ideas that someone else may have thought about and patented. And um, regardless of whether the, the idea was particularly novel or um, really original to the person who patented it. They also represent copy protection, an old idea. Um, it goes back about 30 years of trying to, with technology, prevent people from sharing software. And end user license agreements, which are the legal documents that we sign when we use software that's provided um, usually um, in this proprietary way. Um, and it includes things like the user agreements on sites like Facebook, um, as well as the, the, the EULA licenses that you get with software like Microsoft Word. On the other side, we have Linus Torvalds and Richard Stallman, who we heard, we heard Stallman this morning, a, a legendary figure in this um, world. Um, that represents what we call free software. That's Richard's term. Sorry. Keep saying that. Uh. Oh boy. It's on some kind of automatic. Uh, here. All right, let me see if I can. Stop it. All right. I think that's what I needed to do. I needed to stop it. So, um, free software, Richard doesn't like this term, but um, it represents one aspect of free software, which is that the source code is open uh, and it's protected that way in the license agreement that you get. It just means you can read it and you can modify it. So, you can get a copy of it if you are distributed a piece of the software. And there's, there are licenses that give you 
Um, also, access to the source code if you just use software over a network, which is a, a more recent innovation called the Afero Clause. Um, there's also a copy left clause that is, exists in the, general, the new general public license, uh, which doesn't exist in all open software. So that's why Richard doesn't like this term open software. The copy life left provision uses copyright in order to demand of anybody who modifies software that's released under a free software uh, general public license to share back their modifications. So that no one can take the work of others, make it, uh, make some proprietary extension of it, and then make that proprietary. You have to share um, if you got the benefit of work that other people have done. That's Richard's idea, and um, it also includes this idea that there's no warranty. So you get to freely modify the software by you know your user, but there's generally no promise provided by the people who wrote the code, you do it at your own risk. That's part of the culture of free software. Um, today, we're living in a different world that's really dominated by the web and what um, some people call the cloud. And again, a term that Stone doesn't like, but it's out there. Um, and the dominant figures in this world on, this, on this, these two sides that correspond to the earlier era are on the, on the left side, we have um, Sergey Brennan and Larry Perry, Page from Google, Mark Zuckerberg from Facebook, um, that represent a commercial proprietary model for um, control of the social web or the social internet. On the right, we have um, Jimmy Wales, who's the head of the Wikimedia Foundation and Wikipedia. Um, who, at least through those organs, I think represents a much more free, user-oriented experience in the social web. Um, but we don't really have anything corresponding to Mark Zuckerberg in that world yet. There's nothing that has taken hold of um, social media in the free and open world that course would, would correspond to Facebook or LinkedIn or these tools that people use. Um, in addition, we have a new phenomenon that's brought about by the, the app world on devices like iPhones, iPads, um, and other smartphones and so on, uh, which is particularly in the, in the Apple sphere, an approval filter that exists for anything that's distributed through the App Store. This is the icon for the App Store uh, on the iPhone and iPad. And um, that filter, instead of the old paradigm in which it's presumed if you're a user, say, of Facebook or um, Google Plus or any of these services where you can put up a website and a profile, that you put it up there, or YouTube, you put your content up there, and it's presumed to be OK. So you do it, and um, there may be some filtering going on, but for the most part, they don't make a complex decision about whether you can whether you can put your content on there. If somebody complains, though, or if they decide because of their own procedures that you've violated something or they don't like you, then they can get rid of your content. This approval filter idea, though, is everything goes through review before it ever gets distributed. So if you want to put out an app, out to the world in the App Store, in the iPhone or iPad, then it has to be approved by Apple. And they can approve or disapprove anything they want. So there's there have been some famous examples of this. My the one that I care about the most right now is this the Drones Plus app, which how many of you have heard of that? This is see a few. More would if it were available. Unfortunately it was um, not approved, it's not allowed by Apple. Uh, Drones Plus is an app, works perfectly well, and you can see what it looks like um, on an iPhone here. It's a, um, an application that allows you to see when drones, robotic warfare attacks have killed people in other countries. These are attacks by the US. These are attacks by payer dollars at work. Um, so it really seems like a useful pro-social, political um, tool that we all should, we shall, should have access to this information. 
Um, Apple rejected it on the justification that it is crude and objectionable. Um, to which my favorite reply on, on a blog that discussed this was, well, at least they still have fart apps. Um, I don't know if any of you have downloaded a fart app. Uh, it's just a, an app that sits on your phone that when you press a button, farts. Um, all, the, all the major platforms, mobile platforms, have fart apps. And the reason is that they're very profitable. Um, there are people making $10,000 a day through fart apps. Um, but that's not crude and, and objectionable enough, I guess. Uh, however, this, this app, the Drones Plus app, is. So that's an additional level of control that's been taken away, not just from users, but from content providers in the, the paradigm of approved uh, content. So an alternative paradigm that I described in more detail a couple years ago, I'll just go through briefly today, is this what I'm calling control by users. It's an attempt to generalize the idea of free and open source software and some other ideas that have been put forward uh, for the social web and social internet, like uh, things like um, do not track um, the, the user's bill of rights, concepts like that that you might have heard out of that are, are trying to gain traction. They're mostly kind of initiatives that have, can be voluntarily adopted by sites with some success, with some limited success. If we put all these things together, I think we get this concept of control by users. And um, just to give some examples to motivate it, sorry, we're back to having to do this again. Um, consider, consider these. So imagine that you want to know how your data are being collected and used, um, or you want to know uh, what data are stored about you by third parties. Um, you want to control the privacy of your data in a, in a way that you can understand. Uh, to control whether data are publicly searchable. Um, you want the freedom to move your data to a different host or platform if you don't like the provider that you have. You want that to be at least possible with not, without um, an overwhelming amount of difficulty. You want the freedom to move, uh, sorry, to control who can read or edit your data, um, to be able to, to edit or delete the data that you have created, um, to know if you want uh, how a platform works, to be able to install, use, and modify the software underlying that platform, um, and to have the design of the platform reflect your need. So all that, those set of desires um, add up to a set of principles which I defined in greater detail two years ago and which I'll give you a link online for more details. But it comes down to about six different ideas. Um, being able to control privacy. Uh, data portability, which is this idea of being able to have, have your data be separate from the place where it's stored and have you be able to, to move it to a different host um, and also to be accessed um, as it's on that host from different places without interruption, without having to provide authentication that you don't know how to provide, for example. Um, creative control, um, things like the Creative Commons license help protect that um, for the users who create content. Um, Network-free software, which is the, that's the Afero Clause version of the free software licenses, which um, basically just updates the general public license for the web uh, and plugs the loophole that allows um, companies that use, that, that, that build on free software from, from hiding their modifications because they're not actually distributing the software. They're just serving it to users over a network. Um, participatory design, or the, the ability of users to have input into, to have their um, needs reflected in the design of the software that they're using. And ultimately, user governance. Um, the ability to, to vote, to have a voice in the governance of the um, the platform and the software and the content. Um, there are elements of this that you see in lots of different sites, including even Facebook, has had this uh, ability to vote 
in place for the last few years. So that if you're a Facebook user, they say if enough Facebook users vote in an election about a design change or a policy change, then we will respect that vote. Um, in the last few weeks, they've they made an announcement that they want to take that right away, and they haven't actually it hasn't actually been enforced in any case that I know of because not enough users they set they set the threshold quite high, not enough users bothered to vote maybe because they didn't think voting in the context of Facebook was really that relevant. But um, in any case, this is one thing that um, sites can do. So that's controlled by users. Um, and this is an attempt to capture ele the elements that would be needed to provide an alternative to these commercial sites. Uh, and there's a link you can copy if you want to see a uh, more full description of control by users. So I'll leave that up for a while. That's a, it's actually a PDF. Um, Okay, so what I want to do is talk about what's happened with attempts. I think this is just an, an intuition that a lot of people have shared and tried to build things that obey these, this idea of control by users. What's happened with that and uh, what are the prospects for the future? Uh, well, we have a project called DEEM. It's at deme.stanford.edu that I've been working on now for nine years. and. Um, it's been through several different iterations, the most recent of which started in 2008. Um, and it works, and um, there's quite a bit that you can do with it. It's, we're using it now for a sponsored project um, by the government, actually, to help run a site that does public input, public consultation into healthcare policy. And that's funding some of the work that we're doing now. But it's a slow process. It's me and a few students and one programmer working on it in all of us in our spare time. None, are, none of us are full time on it. So um, the result is a lot of the labor intensive stuff that goes into websites has been, has been slow to, to get produced. And so it's very useful, but it requires being a, a power user in a way and being, being willing to, to go up the steep learning curve in order to be able to use it. So I, I don't consider it to be ready for prime time still, even though it's got a lot of functionality at this point. If we look at the top 20 websites, this is from this morning, I looked on alexa.com and got the 20 websites, top 20 websites by traffic in the world. You can see that uh, almost all of them are proprietary commercial websites with a couple of bright spots that I noted there. And number six is Wikipedia, which I think is, of the large websites, by far the one that comes the closest to embodying this idea of control by users. Um, they even have governance um, as an element uh, in which any user can participate. Um, and it's the software itself, the MediaWiki software is licensed under a free software license, the GPL. Um, and then the 20 wordpresscom is the um, commercial hosting service or the, 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 um, the company that hosts WordPress sites, but the software that's put out by the WordPress Foundation is free software. It's made available under general public license and that software is installed on lots of different sites in the world other than WordPress.com sites. So you can, it has data portability, you can move your your data in WordPress to any WordPress host, including your own. And it runs about 15% of those sites that are on the internet or on the web. Um, there's another project called Drupal, which is also um, GPL licensed that runs about 2% of websites. That's the, the leading content management system. Um, and so that would be reflected in lots of individual websites. It's not hosted. Um, in one place as much as WordPress. So those are the bright spots. And they're not, they don't each completely embody control by users, but they're far ahead of the other sites. Um, but you know, all of the rest of the sites and the big ones, including in huge domains like social networking are commercial and proprietary. So if you want to, if you're in labor and you want to reach lots of members, you're pretty much forced right now to use Facebook. Um, that's just the way it is. And um, I have never created a Facebook account partly because I want to demonstrate to myself and to others that it's possible to live without it. 
But I am giving up the ability to reach people um, as a result until we have something that is uh, an alternative to it. There are some notable uh, efforts to provide alternatives that I recommend checking out. One is Diaspora, which is a piece of a FARO general public licensed um, code and, and hosted distributed social network that's been developed over the last three or four years. Um, and it went, it became a community project in August of this year, which means that it's now got a broad developer base and not, not real strong leadership. So we're not, not sure what that's gonna mean, whether it's gonna flourish or wither um, as so many projects have. But right now it's still, uh, last year it was the social network of the year. Um, lots of people have joined it and um, still viable, I think. Z Social is, uh, comes out of the Z Mag, Z Communications group. Uh, it was an attempt to provide something that's specifically geared toward organizing. And you can use it with an existing Facebook account. You can log into it with Facebook. You can also create an account there if you don't have Facebook. But it's geared toward connecting you with friends of like mind and with tools that are geared toward organizing. So I think these are both things that, um, that are viable as alternatives. They haven't caught hold in a large enough way by far so that you could replace using Facebook for them if you want to organize a real campaign. But um, I'd encourage people to, to check them out and create accounts there if you're so inclined. Um, so one of, the, one of the barriers, one of the problems, one of them is that 10 years ago, um, people didn't care as much as they do now about visual design. So this is the design of Craigslist, circa about 2000. Um, Ten years ago, Craigslist was still the top social media site. And Craig Newmark wrote a lot of the, soft the original software himself, and by his own admission, he has no talent for visual design. Right? So people, but people were willing to use it anyway because it was useful. And they were, uh, it was simple enough so that people could figure out how to use it. Over time, though, what's happened is we now have mm, let's see. This is Facebook's uh, timeline, a screenshot of their design circa 2012. Um, and it's obviously visually much more complex. There's a lot that's been put into this, but this reflects the fact that Facebook has 2,000 engineers working there. So to produce a website, which is just a 2D thing that you see on a screen, just like Craigslist, which originally was created by one person, um, it now takes over 1,000 programmers. Um, so that's a big barrier to, and, and those there's people are working full time. Many of them are, are working you know, 12 hour days a lot of the time. Um, they're being rewarded for it a lot, to be sure at Facebook, but um, it's very hard to compete with that if you're a, a grassroots project that isn't providing, isn't making your software specialists into, into millionaires. Um, yeah. So what are some, some challenges that we have to face, I think, if if labor and, and organizing is to move into alternative spaces that are controlled by users, one is that there's been an aggressive effort promoted, I think most especially by Apple, to take control away from users and also to um, remove the details, to hide the details of what's going on from users. Now this, I think of it as being embodied in Steve Jobs' phrase, it just works, uh, which he was saying uh, you know, up in, into the last year that he was that he died, uh, that he lived. Um, the "it just works" phrase is uh, the idea that as a user, you don't have to worry about the details. You shouldn't worry about the details, and you can rely on whatever is provided to you to work very well, or they would or it wouldn't be put out to you, um, and. Uh, so, for example, Apple's been trying to move a lot of its serving into what it calls iCloud so that you can access things from any device and so on. And from the user's point of view, Jobs want you to, wants you to think, 
it just works and not think about whether the data are even sitting, not want you to know whether the data are sitting on your device or out on someone else's server. Those details you don't need to worry your pretty little head about. That contrasts with the dominant philosophy under the free and open source paradigm, which is known as RERO, which stands for release early, release often. Now, this is an idea that when, you, when you're developing software, if you want your users to participate in and have an input into it, you have to release the early versions um, to those who are willing to use it and then gradually improve it as you get feedback. So you'll go through a longer cycle of um, Im improvements in which you're frequently updating and your users have to be willing to put up with that. You've seen this philosophy embodied even in companies like Microsoft and Google, which have, have put out a lot of their uh, things like Gmail and, and Google Maps under beta um, for long periods. So that, but users wanted to use them because they were they were useful, and um, users' willingness to, to to work with something that wasn't perfect helped Google and or Microsoft improve it. Um, another big barrier is software patents. So um, this is a, a a big one because it means that if you're a, a project that's trying to provide an alternative to something. Um, you may not be able to afford the legal costs or have the, the patent uh, armament to fight against infringement lawsuits that may come your way from the big players. So um, this is something that Richard Stallman has been very vociferous about is that the, the evil of the software patent. So I think we need to challenge the, the culture here and among activists promote greater understanding of exactly what the consequences are of using certain software that's, that's provided in certain ways, and also more general education about things like software patents and the way that software is created. So with that, um, I'll end and happy to talk more along with Chris. Yep. I think we're going to have to turn off. Yep. Okay. Let's ask you to have more discussion. Good. Wait. Okay, thank you, Todd, and uh, obviously there are a lot of issues that I'm sure people want to discuss in, in regard to that. Um, one of the uh, areas, of course, uh, of using the internet is to build international solidarity, um, and we uh, and labor tech uh, have seen the need to use internet and use technology as much as possible to get our stories out, to get workers' stories out, uh, not just in this country, but on a global level. And uh, this is critical as a global working class. We face attacks uh, on a global level, and these companies are all linked up together. Uh, miners, longshoremen, uh, fast food workers, I mean, they're in every part of the world. So uh, grabbing the tools of technology and using them for workers, organizing workers' rights, workers' information is absolutely crucial. And our next speaker is actually uh, involved in trying to get the word out and building solidarity uh, for the Americana miners of South Africa who were massacred in their struggle for a higher wage. And uh, he's in the Bay Area, fortunately for us, so they can be here live. We don't have to do it by another means. Uh, and he's uh, also been involved in media efforts in South Africa and uh, communication. So welcome Mazi Buko Jarhara. He's with the Americana Minor Support Committee of South Africa. Let me get the... No, I won't use it. Uh, I'm going to put okay. the... Is it possible uh, to put it on the chair? Put, your, put it on the chair. Uh, I want to put my... Put it down, yeah. okay. Yeah. <coughs> Thank you, Steve. Uh, hello, everyone. I ask for your indulgence because South Africa and the US are not only divided by an ocean, but also by traditions and language. <laughs> so, for example, uh, I found myself uh, lost when I asked for the loo, and I find the name restroom. And then I ask myself, what is particularly restful about those rooms? <laughs> but anyway, so I hope that 
many of the concepts and things I'll talk about can, can be understood. My other indulgence I'm asking for <clears throat> is whether it's okay if I use the word comrade uh, as, as I go along to, to, to refer to, 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 to everyone here. If that's not okay, I'll, I'll struggle along. A bit more about myself. Um, I'm a visiting scholar at Stanford at the law school in a fellowship called Social Change and the Law. Uh, I'm here in the Bay Area until uh, the end of January. Um, in South Africa itself, I was uh, at some point uh, the media officer for the Communist Party, uh, but also I had served uh, on the board of a board set up by law called the Media Diversity and Development Agency. I'll talk about that. Uh, what I also have here in front is a newsletter which talks about the mine workers' struggle in Marikana and the rest of the platinum belt in South Africa. Uh, it's available for distribution from that table, but we do ask for a small uh, contribution for solidarity. Uh, one of the major initiatives on the left in South Africa that covers labor and community stru struggles is this magazine called Amantha. Uh, which I was the co-founding editor of. Uh, the current edition that I've got in, with me is available for sale and it focuses in some detail uh, on an analysis of the mining sector in South Africa and the relevant struggles. My first theme uh, as part of my contribution to the conference really seeks to underline that uh, South African media uh, like media in the US and elsewhere in the world is basically owned by white men, white capitalist men. Uh, in South Africa that has not changed since the democratic change in 1994. Even though there may be a few black faces who have shares in some of these companies that own the media. Uh, so typically it covered the Marikana mine workers strike along the following lines. Those workers were stupid, backward, superstitious Africans uh, when they went to that mine and used uh, some muti, some herbs, to believe that they can strengthen themselves and not to be shot uh, and killed by bullets. I mean, uh, that's, that's completely stereotypical uh, uh, colonial kind of prejudices, uh, which would, for example, not be applied to soldiers who pray before they go to war and so on. So that, 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 the fact that those workers had used herbs was like a major, major story about how stupid and backward they were. Uh, the other dimension is that they were regarded as savages because they dared to arm themselves when they were faced by the violence of the state uh, and, and uh, as, as an initial kind of self-defense mechanism that, that they took this path. <laughs> The other dimension of media coverage of uh, that mine workers' struggle was to regard the demand for an increase from $500 a month to about $2,000 as unreasonable. Who do they think they are? Do they know anything about how profits are made? Do they know anything about how mines are run and so on? There was not even an attempt by South African media to really understand the living and working conditions and where this pain and therefore demand came from. There was not even an attempt to really provide space uh, for, for workers' voices uh, in, in South African media. When I say South African media, I, I mean primarily print, but also importantly, uh, a key player in the electronic media is the South African Broadcasting Corporation, which is a public broadcaster, which is supposed at least to have a much more balanced uh, coverage of, of what's happening in that society, even it failed uh, to, 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 to live up to that role. So as a quick overview, that's the context about the media in South Africa. The second area that's relevant also has to do with internet access, with the ownership of cell phones, and the high costs of telephony and broadband in South Africa. Um, unlike the US and other advanced countries, we have very small numbers of people who have access to the internet through computers and broadband but also even though even though now finally more cell phones 
circulate in South Africa than they are in the number of people, which means that even an old grandmother in the most backward of rural villages has a cell phone. But amongst those with cell phones, literally everyone, very few have smart cell phones which can access the internet and so on. So even the cell phones are not yet an avenue uh, to access the internet. Uh, there's, a, there's a strange structure in South Africa which makes the cost of telephony and broadband quite expensive. Even though there's state policy to make universal access possible, but actually uh, limitations on fiscal resources and even capacity of, of, of the state and the IT sector has meant that that goal of universal access is not about to be met for the next 10 years at least. So uh, the, 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 that, that's another important uh, component of understanding the media landscape in South Africa. Uh, despite this, the internet, social networking, email and cell phones played a very critical role in spreading information about the Marikana massacre and uh, the subsequent wave of strikes uh, in uh, platinum, gold, coal, iron ore belts, as well as now um, the ongoing strike amongst farm workers, uh, which is historic because for the first time in South African history, thousands of farm workers have gone on strike to demand a living wage. So, so despite the, owner, the, the ownership of the media by a small elite that's unaccountable, and despite the lack of access through the internet and cell phones, uh, there has actually been a very significant use. And so, for example, we started Amanda in 2006. We didn't really focus on building the website in any creative way. We focused, uh, we focused on the printed form, which is critical given, given the situation I was painting earlier. But now, what we've seen is an increase in the number of hits uh, on, on the Amanda website, something like 15,000 hits a month, which is significant for, for a country with low internet access. And again, um, uh, using the, the website for um, immediate struggles, current struggles, has also been very useful. Uh, so, so, so there's been a very interesting coverage of, of, uh, of the Marikana strike and other recent strikes on the Amanda website. So, the experience of how the internet and social media and so on have spread information and discussion about the Margana strike shows that there's a huge potential uh, if a number of things happen, uh, particularly uh, the broadening of universal access to, to, to the internet and, 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 and communication generally. Now, in light of the situation and in light of how uh, the internet spread the story about Marikana, it's also useful to, to think about alternative media institutions or initiatives that exist in South Africa. Um, there are a number of them which are web-based, but for the reasons already mentioned, access is limited. I've already mentioned Amanda. And in addition to Amanda, there is a very important initiative called the Workers' World uh, Media, which I understand the director of spoke at the beginning of the conference via Skype. It has been very crucial because it has basically been able to win a weekly slot called Workers on Wednesday that uh, plays for an hour, uh, or that's broadcast for an hour on SAFM, the leading uh, public um, broadcast a channel, news channel in South Africa. That, that, that's a major achievement given how hostile even the public broadcaster is to working class media. The second thing that the Workers' World Media have done has been to initiate what they call labor media collectives so that in local areas what you have are organized groups of workers and trade unions who tie up and link up uh, with community media activists and other media people who are sympathetic to working class struggles to then uh, work out uh, the production of content for local community radio stations in particular and hopefully later on for local community newspapers. This has been important in a number of centers, Johannesburg, Cape Town, Deben and Port Elizabeth, but this must still grow these labor media collectives. Of course, you've got trade union websites and a few other sites uh, of fairly progressive NGOs and some kind of community social movements. Uh, but, but this is still very far from 
an effective system that produces news, that generates news, that spreads the news across the board in quite a significant way. A major limitation here is how the so-called community media sector is weakened and unable to play a progressive role in support, in support of worker and community struggles. Since 1994, when democracy uh, was introduced, uh, the community media sector grew in terms of the numbers of radio stations, the numbers of uh, newspapers, and now about three community TV stations. Uh, the biggest problem it faced was skills, but also um, financing, funding. So through its efforts, the Media Development and Diversity Agency was established uh, basically through legislation. The original argument from community media activists was that the Media Development and Diversity Agency, the MDDA, should be funded on the basis of a levy that's imposed on print and electronic media, mainstream commercial print and, com and, 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 and electronic media. Uh, a levy then that would ensure that there is almost a permanent fund, a permanent public fund, which then would be controlled and, and be accountable. Uh, to par Parliament. It was supposed to be a statutory body that's got a board that's appointed through a parliamentary process and then that board would be renewed through such a process on an ongoing basis. And it would, it would then not only fund community media but it would also play a, a strategic role in monitoring the diversification of the media as well as the development of the media insofar as it comes close to approximating access to the right to information and so on. Uh, that um, framework was not fully achieved because government compromised uh, with mainstream commercial media when it opted not to impose a levy but to reach an agreement which basically established a system of voluntary contributions. To be fair to capitalist media, they paid these voluntary contributions since the MDTA was established in about 2003. Uh, however, the fact that it's voluntary contributions means that the amount of funding that's, that's received from, the, from, from commercial uh, voluntary contributions is limited compared to what it would have been if it was a, 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 a compulsory levy. The second problem the MDDA faces is that it's really not able to play a critical strategic role to really put pressure uh, on trends in media diversification, in media development. So it has not even produced significant reports that tell us what's happening in this regard, uh, partly because of the, of the funding crisis. It can only do so much, and it is forced to push most of its, of, of its funds, to limited funds, to, to, to finance community media. It could have had a significant research program. It could have had a significant program to enable community media to be able uh, to, to, to push for more changes. The third problem, maybe not necessarily of the MDTA's own doing, is uh, the fact that at the local level, community media is under pressure from the state and from commercial media. Commercial media in South Africa has what it calls community media, which is different from the community media I've been talking about. So for example, in a city like San Francisco, the San Francisco Chronicle would be owned by whatever company, a group of companies. And then within that stable, it would have what it calls a community newspaper, which is a free knock -off, a drop off newspaper, which is basically local news uh, that covers and material or whatever, uh, local, uh, uh, local suburb or local town, news that not make it the San Francisco Chronicle. Of course, then the financing of these drop-offs, uh, which are distributed for free, is through advertisement. Now, uh, community media of the kind I've been talking about up till now compares to compete uh, for limited funding streams, uh, rather advertising streams, against uh, these, these kind of drop-offs that are the only part of big media stables. Um, the other problem when it comes to, to the local uh, state is the fact that Many of the community media groups then tried to access advertisement, ad advertising revenue from municipalities, from
from government departments or hospitals or whatever other services were there in, 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 in uh, particularly related to the state. Now, given the nature of politics in South Africa, some of these municipalities have tended to then seek to use to, to seek to use their financing stream through advertisements to control the content of, 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 what, of what is in this media. So, so that, that has actually then meant the death of independent community media. Now, another interesting initiative in response to this situation is a campaign that has been significant in South Africa over the last two years called the Right to Know campaign, the R2K campaign. Uh, it arose basically to oppose uh, what is called in South Africa the Secrecy Bill, the official title being the Protection of State Information Bill, basically attacks by the state on access to information. Uh, I mean, it's got similar echoes with what happened here during the Bush era. Um, the Right to Know campaign was able to mobilize thousands of activists and a broad coalition, bringing unions, social movements, even NGOs into this broad coalition that opposed uh, the, right, the, the secrecy bill. Uh, of course, the secrecy bill was passed uh, as it happens this week, and now the next stage of the struggle in that regard may be a constitutional court challenge. But in the two years of the R2K campaign, uh, what has also emerged is a very rich discussion about what the right to know, about what the right to information means. So now uh, the, the campaign has decided to broaden its focus, to actually challenge uh, cell phone companies, to challenge uh, the existing policies on ICT and universal access, to really give concrete pro working class meaning to what the right to know and right to information means. I think this R2K space and what it does is a very key area to watch uh, in terms of what it means uh, for, 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 for the use of technology, media, and so on, uh, basically, uh, to support uh, working class self-organization and struggles at the workplace and in communities. I will end there just basically uh, to say that those broad overview points give you a sense of, of, of the state of media and ICT access and what the efforts are from progressive forces in South Africa. And of course, with particular reference to how uh, the Marikana strike and worker struggles in, since then have benefited uh, from, from limited efforts in that regard. Thank you. Thank you, Mazi. Um, so we have some time for some questions or comments. If uh, you know, Mike, you want to take the mic. Mike, if you want to take the mic. <laughs> uh, my question is a legal one. When legal activists in the '60s and '70s took on television, jurisdiction and pleadings and practice were clearly defined by APA regular procedures, FCC, uh, and other hearings. This is different. This is global, as Steve mentioned. This requires out of outer space assets like satellite transmission. This is something that requires treaty resolution. Can you de describe to us any movement toward accomplishing a global treaty? We saw this week a global remedy granted in favor of Palestine against the dominant powers. So we think that might be the best way to go. Can you comment on that? Thank you. Well, the ITU is meeting uh, in Doha, um, can't, no, I, I really can't comment on that. I, I don't know what the regulatory levers are there. Um, and uh, actually, I was going to ask Todd, speaking of, of regulatory le levers, what, where, where are the action points to get to the sort of community software uh, that you, you talked about? Well, there's the um, there's legislation people are talking about in uh, Congress about um, that would protect users' rights about knowing when they're being tracked. That's one example. Um, all this is quite limited, and um, it's also piecemeal. So that's one of the ideas I was trying to get at was we need a general concept like control by users to unify a lot of concepts that have been really pursued separately, like free software do not track, um, the Bill of Rights for users of proprietary websites, and so on. But, so I'm not, unfortunately I can't speak
speak up to the minute about what's happening in the legal realm, because I'm not following it that closely. Um, there may be someone else here who, who does. Yeah, probably Dorothy is, is a good person to talk about that. Whilst Dorothy is coming up, I just have a small point. I do not know what's happening, but I think the challenge for a group like this, for people working with media and communities and, 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 and the unions, is whether there is space to take forward a fight around information and communication as an international public good. I'm not up to date on it, but there has been an international campaign um, through the World Summit on the Information Society and also through the ITU and through the uh, World uh, Information Property Organization, WIPO. And it was led by countries of the Global South, uh, Brazil, India, I think South Africa. And it was significant probably five, ten years ago when it, when it argued that the countries of the Global South have, have endured colonization and therefore needed a special remedy. And therefore were able to enact a campaign around universal rights, around information and communications based on a development agenda. And so they were successful about arguing for that, and they've basically been fighting a rear guard action since then to, uh, and a piecemeal action country by country against um, some of these things. But um, uh, we should update ourselves to see um, if there's a possibility to, to build with that coalition that's already there. Because they were, they were arguing many of the same things that all of you have been talking about, right to communication and right to information. Yeah, thanks. I got a question for Chris. Chris, can you comment on alternative ways of connecting to the internet, specifically mesh networks and internet over ham radio frequencies? I think uh, those are interesting um, initiatives, but remember the picture I showed of the wires in San Francisco. Uh, what I might not have said then is that that picture uh, came from a time when there was AT&T and Pac Bell as separate entities and, and ownership of those wires was split. Those middle mile special access wires, even in a mesh network, would control the communication between between nodes, there, even in the mesh network, you're going to need some sort of nodes where it feeds into uh, middle mile and uh, backbone uh, communications. Uh, so there's that aspect of it. They still, the, the incumbent carriers still control the, that middle mile architecture. The second point, and I think Steve will remember this, uh, any initiative like that that threatens the monopoly of these carriers is met with fierce uh, opposition. And the uh, banner example of that here in San Francisco uh, is, was Tom Amiano's plan to put fiber in the sewer. Every, his plan was anytime the city opened up a street to put in sewer, they would put in a conduit and some dark fiber. Dark fiber itself is not that expensive. Conduit is not that expensive. The expense is digging up the streets. AT&T went to Sacramento. The plan died. Uh, the incumbent carriers have fought municipal broadband across the country. Um, this is a tragedy. If you live in the Mission District, uh, we've had a sewer rebuild for the last two, three years. Sewer pipes stacked up, Valencia, uh, Cesar Chavez closed down while they put these pipes in. We could have had a first class broadband network in that area, first class fiber network, but it was it didn't happen. So in, in while mesh network from a theoretical point of view is great, you're, you've still got the middle mile architecture problem and you've got the political problem. <coughs> I, I think uh, one of the things that has to be addressed is the question of municipalization, public control uh, of, of the communication tools. And um, as uh, Chris pointed out, 
Uh, it is possible to have municipal Wi-Fi in the counties in the United States and have municipal Wi-Fi. And uh, it works very well for people, in particular in rural communities. Uh, there's a reason we don't have that in the United States. There's a reason the United States is behind South Korea and other countries in this, is that you have media monopolies like Comcast and others and who don't want to disrupt their revenue streams. They have people who are forced to spend a lot of their money on their systems. If they have municipal uh, Wi-Fi, uh, people could get their uh, radio, their TV, their phones on municipal lines. So they wouldn't need to pay money to Comcast for these media monopolies. So that's a, that's a whole question there. I think the need for public control of the media is critical. The Verizon workers and AT&T workers have found out that these companies want to destroy their unions. They want to outsource their work and destroy their unions. I think the unions have not been able to challenge politically the capitalist control, basically, of the media, which is destroying their unions. Uh, these unions are being destroyed and decimated by deregulation, by outsourcing, by making all their workers temporary. That's what's going on in, in these uh, the media monopolies, which is another issue that has to be addressed, and that is the destruction of union labor in the regulated, what was the regulated areas like uh, AT&T, the, the telephone lines, that kind of thing. Um, the other thing is, I think what we've discovered here at the conference is that the struggle of the Walmart workers to organize using Facebook and other tools, and Turkey to organize in favor of the, the tech workers, that is threatened by Facebook and these companies. These companies are going to crack down on workers organizing using proprietary technology. And I think that the labor movement, the unions have to have a strategy to unite all workers to defend their public right and public use of, of the internet and public, and to challenge these companies because uh, you cannot just fight them uh, without mobilizing everyone on the level of the public right to communicate, and that's what's being threatened by these companies when they shut down Facebook because you're campaigning against a company uh, which has attacks on democratic rights. Um, the other, the, the last point I want to make is that the international labor, the world labor movement, uh, is, does not have a strategy. I mean, the things that talk put forward are, are concrete issues that can be taken up internationally throughout the world for municipalization of uh, are for public control, public access, transparency uh, of communication. And I think on a global level, we need to take that up in every country in the world. And I would tie that in, to the need for a labor channel. Because while there are religious channels, uh, there are golf channels, uh, there are all kinds of channels. There's no labor channel in the United States. There's no labor channel in South Africa or in Turkey or in any other countries. We need to develop an international labor channel that can raise these issues to an international level. So when the Americana miners are struggling, you can see what their actual stories are. When the Walmart workers are struggling, you can tie that to the Walmart workers here with the Walmart workers in Bangladesh who are making clothing for Walmart. I think we need to internationalize uh, these struggles so we have it with an international channel that can show the struggle of workers throughout the world. A labor channel would do that, including educate people about the use of communication technology um, and the right to, to defend communication technology and our democratic rights in it. Roger? I don't need the mic, I'm teaching. <laughs> you, you want to be able to... I'd like to raise a point I raised this morning. First of all, uh, human ingenuity is astounding. And I think we have some very good minds who, who are dedicated to, to the people, to the struggle of the people. Uh, I also recognize that there are people who have very good skills who are making a lot of money by destroying our communication system that can liberate people. And I have the impression that this battle is waging, being waged all over the world, and I have the impression that, that we may be winning more in Korea than in many other countries. But I would like to know from our good technical minds here how we can do a better job of, of uh, reopening communication once it's been shut down, as in the case of Syria recently, and there are so many cases where when people are successful in organizing, the our our communication system is shut down by, by people who have the technological skills to do that and they can make and, and they're 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 basically renegades who are working for working against the interests of the people. 
So if, if some of you have ideas of how we, our side, can do a better job with our technological brilliance, I'd, be, I'd like to hear that. Thank you. There, there is ham radio. I mean, that's another thing that has been used, an internet on ham radio. So that is one tool that can be used, and, and so far has not been able to be controlled. But of course, that has a limited audience. I mean, the other thing about community access or, or uh, uh, low FM, low power stations is, uh, and this is the Pacific Network, that's another issue, and that is you can, one station could broadcast, and that could be carried by stations all over the world. So you could have a station in Americana or a station in a particular area, and that could be carried worldwide. So that's a way of developing that. There's another aspect which I didn't uh, bring up, and that is labor applications. Uh, in Workers Independent News Wins is trying to develop a labor application. And the labor app would allow people to go to that labor app and then get radio or TV programs throughout the world. So it would facilitate people getting labor information. Uh, uh, on the internet as a labor app. So that's being worked on by WINS. And we're going to try to get support of the unions in the United States to support that because there are labor programs that exist uh, in New York, uh, in, in Chicago, uh, in all, many places in Atlanta, all over the country, but they're all divided up and, and they're not, people don't have access to them easily. So we have to make this user friendly and we have to make these, uh, these you know, programs available, and that would move us closer to the step of a labor channel. Um, so, Steve, to the uh, uh, power transition of the I'm just wondering if uh, one of you guys could talk about the uh, possibility of the transition of control of the internet to the UN and what the implications of that would be. That's, that's a recent development. I don't know if it's, it's a huge area. <coughs> Unfortunately, I don't know enough about it to talk about it intelligently. Uh, but I think that the the people I respect uh, tend to think that there should be a pushback against that, and that uh, the internet control I can uh, should stay in these small. Uh, semi-private or semi-public you know, public, uh, groups. But even in that, I'm revealing the fact that I don't understand the, the basis of it. But the people I respect do not want to see it go to the UN. Yeah, and uh, I mean, as far as communication, obviously deregulation, which is a policy of the United States government, of capitalism, is to deregulate, is taking place on an international level. The IMF, the, the World Bank, these uh, trade agreements, uh, TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership, all these trade agreements globally are aimed at deregulating everything um, to allow the destruction of public utilities, public services, and public control of the media. So let's be clear that the trade policies, the economic trade policies of the United States and the Obama administration and previous administrations are not for public control, but privatization of media. That's why in the United States you have a highly monopolized media operation with one company controlling uh, all, not only the cable channels and the TV, news, the TV channels, but also the newspapers in, in, in the city. So you have your, all your means of public information controlled by one company. And that's been supported and, and further led to not only the monopolization of media and communication, but also the destruction of local news and information. Journals have been uh, attacked. We're going to get into that tomorrow in the session tomorrow on journals. But thousands and thousands of journalists have lost their jobs uh, with this monopolization of the media, where you have one company in control and they just liquidate or get rid of the local journalists so you have more local news and information. It's, it's gone. Uh, with the monopolization of the media. And it, it's basic, basically using the media monopoly to uh, increase profit uh, and to get rid of any kind of local control, local programming uh, for the owners to make more profit in that control of the media. I see someone taking notes here. Uh, the State Department website is an interesting place to uh, research uh, information freedom. You do Google the State Department Information Freedom, you'll get a number of addresses by uh, Hillary Clinton and uh, some of her uh, uh, so, um, management staff uh, about information freedom. And they always talk about how this sort of public-private happy 
world where uh, private interests are, are going to participate in uh, the spread of information freedom. And uh, I think this is a fantasy and I think it really um, obfuscates the problem of private censorship. So my solution to the problems that people have been talking about is a, a revitalized First Amendment that focuses more on communication and information freedom rather than on ownership. But that's a, that's a separate chapter. One, one last question. Yes. Um, this is in reference to the separation of content. Right. And conduit. Um, there are some of us who are still wired users instead of wireless users. And if we were to, to establish labor jobs and protect labor jobs that involve the installation of these physical tables underground before it gets the central office, could we not protect, what can the Public Utilities Commission do to protect those jobs? If you go to, for example, uh, at and and they offer you a universe which is entirely wireless, and you want to preserve the wired communication within your home or within your office, what can the Public Utilities Commission do? Um, first of all, Uverse is not in, in, entirely wireless. There is no such thing as an entirely wireless network. Wireless is a last mile technology. It's, think of it as the fuzz on the peach. The core of the network, whether it's wireless, whether it's VoIP, whether it's plain old telephone service, the core of the network are wires. But I was showing you in the first couple slides. So. Um, and then the role of the unions at the Public Utilities Commission is a, a book in itself. Um, CWA at times has been on the right side uh, of the issues and at times has been a very uh, counterproductive force at the Public Utilities Commission. Okay, well I want to thank you all. Thank our panelists for their presentation. And, um, yeah,